One of the biggest misconceptions about Marilyn Monroe centers around her claim that she was rehomed to 13 different foster families over the course of her childhood, leading to a Dickens existence. However, all available evidence suggests that Marilyn's childhood wasn't quite how she painted it, including never being with a strange family nor being in the foster care system. Let's break it down. I know I usually begin with a disclaimer and this video is no different. Most of this financial information was likely unknown to Marilyn during her childhood and the frequent moves probably did contribute to her feeling unloved. The purpose of this video is not to call Marilyn a liar or negate her recollections of how she felt. Instead, it's to show how the adults in charge of her, specifically Grace Goddard, struggled to give her support in a chaotic situation. There's a popular belief that Gladys gave birth to Norma Jean and basically dropped her off at the Bolander's home. However, after giving birth, Gladys took the baby back to her apartment. Unable to afford a crib, Gladys placed Norma Jean in a dresser drawer. Although this sounds horrifying today, it was actually a relatively common practice during this time for poor families to repurpose furniture for their babies to sleep in. On June 11, 1926, Gladys and Norma Jean moved into the home of Albert Wayne and Ida Bolander. Wayne worked as a letter carrier while Ida was a homemaker. The couple took in children whose families could not afford them, charging $5 to $15 a month for their care. Gladys moved out within a few weeks, but she never missed a payment and visited her daughter as often as she could. The Bolenders were Moody Baptists and ran a strict household that was quite different from Gladys's lifestyle. In 1930, Gladys temporarily moved back into their home. Norma Jean would stay in the Bolenders' home until 1933. Norma Jean moved in with Gladys in May of 1933. Gladys would occasionally pick up one of Norma Jean's siblings from the Bolenders' home, Lester, and allow the children to play together. At one point, she even took them on a trip to Catalina Island. This four-bedroom home was located in an affluent area of Los Angeles. Gladys purchased it through an New Deal loan program in the summer of 1933. Costing 5000 Gladys was able to put 750 down on the home. To help make her mortgage payment, she took in the Atkinson family, George, Maud, and Nell, who had lived next to her at Afton Place. In January of 1934, Gladys had her first mental breakdown, resulting in hospitalization. There's a little bit of debate on when Gladys was permanently institutionalized, but we know that Norma Jean stayed at Arbel Drive with the Atkinsons for a time without her mother as she recounted playing with whiskey bottles and cigarette butts outside the home after her mother was gone. The Atkinsons relocated from the Arbel Drive home, taking Norma Jean with them to an apartment on Glencoe Way. This arrangement was temporary and Maude would eventually receive a reimbursement for one month's worth of care. While Grace McKee soared what to do with Norma Jean, she temporarily placed her in the care of Harvey and Elsa Giffen, the parents of a classmate. The Giffens attempted to adopt Norma Jean, but were reportedly denied by Gladys. I don't believe this story is quite true. Gladys was declared legally insane and wouldn't have been able to make any legal decisions while Grace was her guardian. And my guess would be that Grace didn't want to put the little girl up for adoption. This was Grace McKee's apartment where Norma Jean would reside until being placed in the orphanage. Grace would marry Doc Goddard about a month before Norma Jean was sent away. The state of California mandated a one-year stay at the Los Angeles Orphans Home for Norma Jean. This would have allowed family members to come forward for her care while the state decided who to give custody to. Although Marilyn would tell a fantastical story about living there for two years, getting out on the day Jean Harlow died, records show Grace removed her from the facility facility in October 1936. One of the biggest things to happen while Norma Jean was at the orphanage was the banning of Ida Bolander from the facility. After making Norma Jean upset, Ida was unable to visit her former ward. To my knowledge, this is the last time they ever saw one another. Finally, there's a memo that causes confusion as it came from the orphanage's head director, Mrs. Dewey. This document describes Norma Jean and was written in February 1937, leading many to understandably believe she was still there. However, the document was actually for Dewey's records as she close out Norma Jean's file for the state. This was the home of Grace and Doc Goddard. Norma Jean lived there without incident. Authors theorize, however, that she put a strain on the couple's marriage, resulting in her needing to be rehomed. Norma Jean's aunt by marriage, Olive, already had three children from her marriage to Mary Monroe. When Norma Jean moved in, she grew especially close to Ida May. In later years, the only one Marilyn appears to have remained in contact with is Jack Monroe, the only boy of the family. Ida Martin was Olive's mother and the owner of the home the family lived in. The Los Angeles flood of 1938 displaced 
replace the family, resulting in Norma Jean needing to get placed with another family. However, rather than opting to give the new family the care money, Grace continued giving a stipend to Monroe and Martin in an effort to help them rebuild. Norma Jean moved in with Grace's brother, Brian Atchison, and his family, wife Lottie and daughter Geraldine. The Atchinsons made furniture polish that they would sell to local stores. Norma Jean would recall a deep dislike for Lottie, who would yell at her while eating breakfast to get in the car so the family could travel to different stores to pitch their polish. When the Atchinsons didn't work out, Norma Jean moved back in with Grace. This is reportedly when a drunken Doc Goddard fondled the little girl who promptly told Grace it was decided she needed to move again. After the Doc incident, Grace decided to move Norma Jean into the home of her aunt, Anna Lauer. Aunt Anna would be a huge influence on Norma Jean, showing her stability and love. As Anna had purchased Gladys' piano in 1935, Norma Jean was also reunited with a piece of her mother. After Anna went on a vacation, Norma Jean returned to Grace's home on Archwood Street. However, the family soon sold it and moved into Anna Lauer's other property, 6707 Odessa Avenue. Grace and Doc received the news that he must transfer West Virginia for his job and that they couldn't take Norma Jean. Norma Jean and neighbor on Archwood, Jim Dowertree, were encouraged to date one another. If the couple hit off, Norma Jean would not return to the orphanage. Norma Jean returned to live with Aunt Anna to finish her last semester at University High School. Jim proposed to her while she was living with Aunt Anna. Norma Jean moved out when she married Jim. I'm going to go on a small side tangent here. A lot of people wonder why Norma Jean did not continue to live with Anna. Because Grace could not take Norma Jean with her, she would have needed to transfer guardianship. It's likely that Norma Jean would have returned back to the orphanage for this process, meaning she would have been away from Anna for an entire year. It's also possible the frequently ill Anna simply did not want to go through the legal hassle. So all together, we're at 15 separate moves with eight different families. Again, I am not saying this was an ideal way to grow up, but it's not 13 plus different families that Norma Jean didn't know. All the families she lived with were either related to her friends of Gladys or Grace. This does, however, bring us to our next point. Marilyn would recall that families only took her in to receive $5 welfare checks from the state. However, Grace was a thorough record keeper and made sure to file her financial documents with the state for reimbursement from Gladys's estate. There are no records showing the state welfare board provided funding for Norma Jean's care. Instead, the cost of Norma Jean's care from 35 to 40 came out of Gladys's estate thanks to selling off the remainder of her assets and insurance policy. Grace filed two reimbursement requests, one in 1936 and one in 1940. These reimbursements show that Gladys had enough funds to pay for her daughter's care. By 1936, Gladys's estate was nearly depleted. However, an insurance policy kicked in and gave about 1300 to the trust that held Gladys's funds. Grace had to meticulously document what she spent on Norma Jean, and it's evident she was budgeting the funds to ensure Norma Jean received quality care. Items that would not fit into her monthly budget, such as an $11.22 coat in December 1936, were tallied separately to ensure she received reimbursement. She was doing this well into the 40s as well, as shown in this 1941 expense list covering Norma Jean from September through November. After February 1940, Gladys' estate would have held around $200, just over $4,023. It seems likely that both Anna and Grace took over the financial aspect of Norma Jean's care. There may have been further insurance payouts. However, it does not appear that Grace ever filed for a third reimbursement. I think when people hear foster family, they automatically assume that a child is receiving state aid and getting assigned to different families. In Norma Jean's case, Grace was moving her around as she attempted to figure out where the little girl would land permanently. Most caregivers kept her for long periods of time, although there were obvious years where she moved frequently. There's no evidence to suggest state aid was ever given, as even Norma Jean's stay at the orphanage required monthly payments from Grace. Grace spent the modern equivalent of $330 to $600 a month for Norma Jean's base care, a figure that likely aligned with what the average lower middle class family was spending at the time. Grace Goddard worked hard to provide for Norma Jean. Over the course of her life, she didn't always make the right decisions, but I don't think she was ever looking to exploit the situation for her own gain. I think it's important to recognize that Grace did a lot for a child she had no relation to, taking her in when no one else would. Like and subscribe to learn more about old Hollywood stars.